Chapter 16 is talking about the bureaucracy and the public sector, which are pretty much one and the same here as far as what we're going to talk about in this chapter. Now, the book chapter is fairly short and pretty generic. So as you will see pretty quickly, I'm going to talk about the bureaucracy in a little bit more detail and a little bit more specifically, particularly in terms of the United States, so that we can get a little bit better idea of what the bureaucracy is. What we're talking about with the bureaucracy is the public administration of a state. This is the executive branch. So this, as we've already talked about, this is the branch, particularly in the United States, that the president is in charge of. And so therefore, he is over all of the various government agencies and departments that we will look at here in a org chart in just a minute. For example, if we were looking at the parliament in the UK, the cabinet would be over the administration, the administrative functions of the state. So that would be their form of the bureaucracy. In the United States, we have the three branches of government with uh, checks and balances and separation of powers. And the bureaucracy is that part that's underneath the president in the executive branch. Now, in the United States, these department heads are appointed by the president. Of course, they have to be approved by the Senate. But bureaucrats typically has a negative connotation, as we'll see here in a minute. But bureaucrats are the people that work for government, generally. And so we've got lots of street-level bureaucrats that we deal with on a fairly regular basis, not just for federal government, but for state and local governments as well. Police officers, public school teachers, any type of inspectors like a health inspector, a safety inspector, soldiers, firemen got lots of street-level bureaucrats that we deal with on a fairly regular basis. Now here's looking at the federal government. This gives you an idea of the scope and the breadth of our bureaucracy, which is synonymous with our executive branch. As you can see over here in this box, we've got the legislative branch, which is Congress and its various departments right here. And then over here, we've got the judicial branch, which is primarily the Supreme Court and the lower court. So you can see the various departments right here. But now, as far as the executive branch, what we see here is the executive branch literally entails everything else on this entire chart. So as you can see, what we have is the executive branch is very large, a lot of people. We'll talk about it here in a minute in terms of numbers. But the president has his inner executive office here, which in another class we would get into a little bit more detail on some of these groups in the National Security Council you've probably heard of, Council of Economic Advisors you've probably heard of. He advises, he appoints the, the department heads of all these offices who advise him in his day-to-day -day activities. Here are the cabinet-level departments that we'll look at in a little bit more detail in a second. There's 15 cabinet level departments. And then down here we've got hundreds because we're not going to be able to see all of them. These are just some of the major independent agencies and commissions that we have in the federal government. So that gives you kind of a general idea of the org chart of the executive branch and all of these people that work in this executive branch here doing the day-to-day -day functions of government that's what we generally call the bureaucracy. Now we have to understand just briefly the definition between a private organization and a public organization, which this gives you a little bit more idea of the challenges that a bureaucratic government organization has to deal with. Now any formal organization, whether it's private or public, is designed for some purpose and to be more efficient. With an organization, you've got more strength in numbers, you've got more ability to raise funds and to create some sort of goal or product or whatever your, your general plan is for, for forming that organization. Now, private organizations, those are the ones that we see in the private sector. So you can see the, the correlation there. We're talking about firms and businesses and corporations. 
corporations, things like that. They have some very defined goals. They try to generate sales to sell a product, revenues, maximize their profits, or even uh, increase their shareholder value. And they have certain things that they have to deal with as a private organization. That's competition, dealing with other firms in order to compete for your dollars to sell you a product that's cheaper or better than another competitor. And then having to make sure that that the customers are pleased with your product or with your service so that they that you will keep buying it so that they can keep selling that product and, and generating revenues and making profits. So private organizations are fairly straightforward in that they have pretty clear defined goals depending on what their product is or what their goal is. Now it gets a lot more complicated when you start talking about public organizations and that's organizations in the public sector i.e. in the government. So we're looking at government agencies, government departments, in the executive branch in particular, which make up this bureaucracy. So rather than trying to maximize profit, well, these departments and agencies are run on tax dollars, trying to provide public goods and public services for you, the taxpayer and the citizen. So therefore, they have goals that they have to to meet. They have service measures that they are trying to reach. For example, the Department of Motor Vehicles. They are trying to give you your driver's license and perform other services and they don't really have anybody to compete with because that's the only agency that you have to deal with to go get your driver's license. So therefore you could be standing in line for a long time just to get your driver's license. And so the director of the DMV would try to improve the uh, service measures by perhaps making better directions, more signs, adding more personnel. That requires getting a bigger budget from your bosses in government. You're trying to increase your public satisfaction by perhaps maybe minimizing the time that you're waiting in line or the confusion that's, uh, that you have to deal with to go through and, and get your driver's license renewed or whatever. Another thing that public organizations in the government have to deal with is that because it's they're financed by taxpayer money, we have a right to know what they're doing. We have a right to know exactly what they're spending their money on and how they're spending it. Therefore, you're kind of operating in a fishbowl, so to speak. You're not trying to maximize your profit. You're just trying to deliver public goods and maintain public satisfaction through uh, transparency and reach these goals through a designated budget. And if your budget is not enough, you may not be able to provide the public goods that you would like to. So you may need to increase your budget. That has to require a political process to get more added to your budget. So and another thing that public organizations have to deal with is the politics, because all of these public organizations, as I said before, Every one of these department heads is appointed by the president in the federal branch, in the uh, state branch, they're appointed by the governor. So therefore, they are appointed based on the political party that's in charge at the time. However, the bureaucrats that are providing this service, whether it's the teachers, or the police departments, or the health inspectors, they are trying to respond to the citizen by giving them their public goods and public services as they need, regardless of what the politics are overhead. Because every four years, particularly in the federal government, you probably will have a completely different boss at the top of your agency. But you, as a street-level bureaucrat, whether you're an inspector or a soldier or a police officer or a teacher, you still have to provide that service. So as you can see, the public organizations are dealing with some very uh, much more complicated measures and goals than a private organization may necessarily have to deal with as far as measuring their success. Well, let's go back just a second because this little cartoon suggests the, uh, the negative connotation with bureaucracy. Because uh, if I would ask you, what is your perception of bureaucracy when you hear that word, and generally it's, it's negative. Most people think of this concept of red tape or waiting in line or poor service 
or incompetent officials that uh, you can't fire, stuff like that. We'll address some of those issues here in a second. But what one what uh, a lot of people don't realize is that you're dealing with a lot of government agencies on a fairly regular basis and don't even know it. As far as the public satisfaction, we do see that government service and government employees typically generate the same general satisfaction levels as private organizations would. For example, as you as you might expect, if you were comparing private employees versus public employees, you might expect that private employees that are working for an organization that's trying to maximize profit and to sell a product and maybe innovate and get a bonus, well, then you might expect that they would be rated higher in personal achievement or perhaps even in ambition because they are trying to maximize their profit or to increase their entrepreneurial value out there in the world. But when you look at things like educational achievement or civic duty, public service, compassion and self-sacrifice and ethics and things like that, we see that public employees are rated even higher than private employees. So there you can see, uh, even as far as when it comes to work habits and competence, we see a relatively equal ratings across the board. And as you can see, this is from numerous sources over the years of political scientists that study the public satisfaction of the bureaucracy as compared to public satisfaction of a private organization like Microsoft or Google or Apple, stuff like that. So let's talk very briefly about four basic types of organizations in the bureaucracy in the executive branch. We have cabinet departments, and there's 15 cabinet level departments, but what we're gonna be looking at generally is what we would call the third tier bureau of cabinet departments. So we'll look at those individually here in a minute. We also have numbers of independent agencies in the executive branch. There are some examples right there. We'll talk about some more of those in a minute. We also have government corporations in, in the uh, executive branch. Post office is one of those. We'll talk about why they're called government corporations here in a minute. And then a fourth type of organization in the executive branch are the regulatory commissions. So we'll talk about a few of those here in a second. So first of all, let's look at some various cabinet level departments. Here's the Department of Justice, one of the 15 cabinet departments, as you will recall, Here's my cabinet level departments right here. There's 15 of them, and there's the Department of Justice right there. So what we're going to do is zoom in on the Department of Justice and look at their org chart. And the important thing to realize is that there's deputy secretaries and undersecretaries, and there's administrative offices in each of these branches. But as far as the bureaus that we deal with that get the work done, we're looking at the third tier bureaus, and here's... In this particular case, here's the third tier bureaus of the executive branch, and some of these should be very, fairly well known. FBI, DEA, there's the DEA right there. There's the United States Attorney's Office. There's the Bureau of Alco Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms. We've also got Bureau of Prisons, United States Marshal Service right there. So there's the third tier bureaus for the Justice Department. These are the it's the executive agencies where the, the bulk of the work is done as far as providing public services for the citizens. Here's the Department of Homeland Security, which was created after 9-11, and it, re, it required a reorganization of government. So as you can see up here, we've got our deputy secretaries and our administrative offices. But what's most important is the third tier bureau level organizations right here. These are the ones that are providing the, the public goods and services that we recognize. So here's TSA. You probably, if you've ever flown in an airplane in the last 10, 15 years, you're, very, you're probably very familiar with the TSA. Here's the uh, Customs and Border Protection. Here's the Immigrations and Customs Enforcement right here, ICE. This actually, uh, Customs and Border Protection, this used to be considered the, or known as the Border Patrol, important agency 
as far as immigration control that's a fairly controversial issue right now. The Secret Service is also located in this branch, as is FEMA, as is the Coast Guard. So let's give you a couple of examples. Here's the Department of Treasury, and I blew up the third tier bureau levels right here. So some of these you're probably familiar with. As far as the third tier bureau, there's the IRS, third tier bureau in the Department of Treasury. Department of Defense, here's all your, your third tier agencies right here. DARPA, probably a, and a DIA, probably have heard of them. And there is the NSA right there. Some very well-known agencies having to do with our surveillance. DARPA, a agency that is looking at research projects. So let's talk about some independent agencies. The CIA is an independent agency because it needs to be fairly autonomous in gathering intelligence. It cannot necessarily be loyal to the Navy or loyal to Homeland Security. It reports the CIA as part of that inner office of the uh, president there. The CIA director reports directly to the director of national intelligence who actually sits in that executive office in the National Security Council with the president. So the CIA is providing somewhat an autonomous and independent type function of gathering intelligence that uh, the president is able to figure out what needs to happen with it in the protection of our national security because the president, of course, is our commander-in-chief. EPA is also an independent agency because it cannot be beholden to a particular agency that may have a conflict of interest in trying to make the environment cleaner. So therefore, the EPA is a independent agency. The NTSB, the uh, Transportation Safety Board, is also an independent agency because it may need to be independent in order to investigate an accident that needs to be separate from the regulatory bureau in the uh, Department of Transportation to avoid a conflict of interest in order to investigate a problem that could have been the fault of the uh, highway administration in another department. So they cannot have that overlap or conflict of interest. The NTSB has to be able to investigate that problem without interference from the regulatory arm in the Department of Transportation. So that gives you an idea of why these agencies are independent. Same thing with the U.S. aid agency right here, because, for example, if the, uh, if the State Department was over this group right here, they would say, oh, well, we need to get this particular country on our side to help with the war on terrorism. Well, then that would be a conflict of interest because then we would be giving them money just so that they would be our allies, whereas this particular agency right here would be giving money strictly because they need it in order to develop their economy. So that would provide a reason why this group right here, the U.S. Agency for International Development, would be an independent agency. So there's another type. Government corporations are called so because they are set up by the government to literally conduct their own business and raise their own revenue, so to speak. They are set up to handle a business and commercial activity and finance themselves. Now, the post office is one of the most popular and well-known of these type of agencies. But as we know, over the last 15, 20 years, the Internet has really cut back on the number of letters that people write. And the post office has had financing difficulties. And it is kind of operating in the red. And so government has to help keep it financed. So the post office is investigating ways to try to make it more financially flush. So that's a challenge that the government's looking at. The uh, Federal Reserve System, we talked about that just briefly. The central bank is able to finance itself because all of the banks that are members of the national banking system, the Federal Reserve System, are paying fees, and they also can charge interest on their loans to the Banner Bank. So the Federal Reserve finances itself, and as well as the uh, they take the money that the Treasury prints and use that money to feed 
the uh, monetary system. Federal Reserve is actually given quite a bit of money back to the Treasury as a result of what they can make on their interest in member bank fees. Amtrak is another fairly well-known government corporation because it operates like a normal train system would, where the user pays for it. The government also invests money in that, hopefully to get a return on their investment. Amtrak, of course, is fairly controversial because every time there's a problem with it, there's a lot of public outcry as to why we're spending government money on a rail system. You could argue either way that a government-run rail system would be very helpful and useful and would provide, such as in countries like France and China and Japan, where they have uh, incredibly sleek and modernized public transportation systems, not quite so much in America because of our general attitude towards spending money on public goods such as this. So it will remain controversial for, for a long time. And then there's other government-sponsored enterprises like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which are financial institutions that provide loans for people, particularly low-income people, to get into houses. So those are some examples of government corporations. And the last type of government agency is the regulatory commissions. These are typically led by three-person panels. All three are, of course, appointed by the president. And what these regulatory commissions do is provide the regulatory function over all the different sectors of our society. Federal Trade Commission regulates the trade system. Federal Election Commission regulates the elections, as you can see. Product safety, regulated. Uh, futures trading, as far as stocks and bonds and derivatives trading in our financial system. And, of course, we also have an Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission that, again, is a regulatory arm that may be reviewing some problems, which could also make it necessary to be in a separate category than what OSHA would be in the Department of Labor. So, again, we're just getting kind of an overview here of the four types of agencies that we have in our bureaucracy. So now let's talk about why we have this bureaucratic organization in, in government, in pretty much any government. You have a bureaucratic arm that does the day-to-day -day administrations of the government. Now, our modern bureaucracy really started to take shape in the 19th century in conjunction with the Industrial Revolution. Prior to that, we had what is called the spoil system where government jobs were typically provided by loyalty, by patronage, to where whoever was in charge would appoint people who were to loyal to him that would make sure that he would continue to get reelected. And then so therefore, in return for your support, I will give you jobs or I will give you contracts. I will, you know, literally you're, you're pretty much kind of paying for a job. So that was very much potentially ripe for corruption. And as we see, when you look at your history of the uh, America during the late 19th century, the uh, progressive era, the Gilded Age, that sort of thing, we started to see a lot of, of attempt at reform to try to clean this system up. The country was growing dramatically during the Industrial Revolution, and the government departments that were supporting the economy were growing as well. Because as the economy grows, government also grows in order to support that sector of the economy. So during this period, we had several clientelist type departments, agriculture, interior labor that were coming into being at that time. Uh, just to give you an idea of what tends to be the biggest expense in government, well, as of 1890, the Civil War pension fund was the largest government expense in 1890. So that kind of correlates with Social Security being the largest expense in our government today. Even 25 years after the Civil War, the fund that was providing 
pensions to widows, orphans, and survivors of civil war was the largest expense of government at that time. So we start to see the bureaucracy start to form as a result of this growing economy, the desire to clean it up and to create a system where government officials are appointed on the basis of their qualifications and maintain that job based on their expertise. Now, one of the things we tend to think is that federal government is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, as far as the amount of money that it requires to operate it, yes. But as far as the number of people, government employees in the federal government, as you can see, has remained fairly static over the past, over half of a century. And in fact, it actually has been declining somewhat. So what we're seeing is that the number of state government employees has been increasing a little bit, and the amount of local government employees has been increasing quite a bit. So there's where you see a discrepancy in what most people perceive in what is actually happening. Happening. Government employees is around 2.7 million, and this is not including uniformed military personnel, which puts it about the same level as it was decades ago. But local bureaucratic employees have been rising, somewhat tapering off a little bit here. As this bureaucracy took shape, particularly in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, there were some scholars that were really studying as to what is this animal that we're creating. Because prior to the uh, late 1800s, there really was no such thing as a formal bureaucracy. It actually had to grow into this system that it is today. So what we have here is four basic factors that make the bureaucracy somewhat efficient, which may sound like a, a kind of contradiction as, as far as our negative perception of a bureaucracy. But the, this bureaucratic arm of government has been evolving in a way as to try to make it as efficient as it can be under the circumstances. And one of the reasons is the hierarchical structure, where you have a clear chain of command, a clear division of labor, in order to make sure that tasks get done. And interestingly enough, private organizations over the past century have pretty much copied the general hierarchical structure as a general form of setting up your organization. Also, the bureaucracy has incurred a, a considerable amount of standardization. So regardless of who's in that office, you have a standard set of rules a standard routine, a standard procedure that you have to follow that takes a lot of the, the bias or the politics out of that process. Follow the standard, standardized rules and procedures. And there's also a considerable amount of consistency because of the fact that you've got this changing wave of politics at the top of your bureaucracy. Every four years, you could have a completely different party in power. But according to the civil servant system, to where you're hired on the basis of your qualifications, civil servants maintain their jobs in general, despite the shifting political appointees above them. Civil servants are provided some form of tenure to give them a little bit more security in their job, which could be a little bit more routine. Right? You're not going to get a bonus working as a government employee, but you, you also have some other things such as tenure or pension plans that provide a little bit more incentive for you to be as a civil servant that you don't perhaps get some of the benefits of being in the private sector of, a, of huge raises or bonuses or being the owner of your firm, that sort of thing. And then the other thing is, of course, experience. Civil servants are hired based on their qualifications. That was one of the major reforms from the spoil systems. So therefore, you can maintain your job through expertise and a certain amount of professional qualifications. So this is part of how the bureaucracy has evolved into being somewhat of an efficient system 
Let's talk about the basic purposes of the executive branch, or in other words, the bureaucracy. The first thing, of course, is to implement the laws. We've already talked about the separation of powers in government. Congress makes the laws, and then once those laws are signed into the uh, law by the president, then those laws are delegated by the Congress to the executive branch in order to interpret those laws, translate those laws, and literally fill in the blanks in order to implement them to the citizens of the United States. And for this reason is why the bureaucracy or the executive branch is considered somewhat the fourth branch of government in itself because of this rulemaking process. These organizations in the executive branch, as we speak every day, are constantly making new rules and regulations for us to follow. So that's part of what is, you know, of what we have to deal with in our life, rules and regulations. So as you can see, your notices, proposed rules, and rules are constantly being created every day. So this rulemaking process is very powerful, and that's why you might want to call it the fourth branch of government. Presidential documents are also published on that as well. And then, of course, the thing that we most know the executive branch and the bureaucracy for is to deliver public good or service. For example, our military, deliver our transportation, deliver our education, deliver our libraries, things like that. How do we control this bureaucracy? The president, he's in charge of it. How does he try to control his own brand that he's over? In fact, he's the boss of. He can't possibly know what they're all doing. And we've already talked about what the president's powers are. He can appoint all of these agents heads. So he is appointing people that are going to be loyal to his agenda, that are going to try to prevent any scandals from coming up and biting his administration in the butt and making him look bad. So therefore, he has to appoint people that are very competent, very clear as to what the president's goals are, what his agenda is, and they are loyal to that agenda to trying to make his administration as successful as possible. The president also can use executive orders, as we talked about, to change the structure or to provide a rule that the bureaucracy is going to have to follow. So that's another way that he controls his own bureaucracy. And he also has to propose the budget. And if a certain agency is not getting their work done, he could perhaps say, well, you do not need as much money. So I'm going to slash your budget and I'm going to propose that you get less money next term. And he may also say that you're going to get more money next term so that you can improve your service on your public goods. Now, what does the Congress do to try to control the bureaucracy? Now, one of the things that they can do is what is called legislative intent. They can make those bills as specific or as vague as they want in order to try to get the bureaucracy to get under a little bit more control. For example, if they are trying to pass a bill, a tax bill, so the IRS is going to have to deal with this bill, so Congress could make that bill very specific so that the IRS has to do exactly what's in that bill. So therefore, that's a way that Congress is putting them on a short lease and trying to control what the IRS is doing by making that bill more specific. Now, on the other side of the coin, for example, they could make a bill that's pretty generic, generic or vague, for example, to the, I, to the uh, EPA and say, OK, we just want you to lower pollution on a certain industry. And so they can make a very short bill. And then the uh, EPA would have a lot of leeway and a lot of leverage to try to figure out how to enforce factories and these private farms to lower their pollution. Now, the Congress also has the power to approve the budget. So that's a pretty big power of the purse that would uh, give them some control over the bureauc bureaucratic arm. And they also have that oversight function where they can call these agencies under subpoena, they can call them in front of a, a, a committee investigative hearing and grill them under oath 
and find out what went wrong on that program. Where did that money get spent? What uh, what happened with this scandal? What went wrong? Was there any uh, incompetence or malfeasance going on in that program that we can investigate? So that's one of the powers that Congress has over the bureaucracy. How do we try to reduce the bureaucracy? Because every administration is worried about the expansion of government, which is very difficult to prevent as we get bigger and more complex and more uh, populated. Now, one thing that they can literally do is cut a program or terminate a program. This is very difficult to do because once an agency gets formed, you have functions that it provides, you have clientele that it uh, provides a service to. It's kind of difficult to cut an agency. So they may do this incrementally over time or reduce their budget or perhaps set a target gate date uh, out in the future, say 10 years, we are going to cut this agency in 10 years, so therefore you can see it coming. So that's one way. They can also deregulate by reducing the amount of regulations that are required on a particular industry in the private sector. And so therefore, if you have less regulations that you need to enforce on that industry, well, then you need less inspectors. You need less regulators in that agency. So therefore, that's another way of cutting back on personnel and the bureaucracy. Another thing is called devolution. And that's uh, typically what federal government has been doing for a long time at various uh, rates, is that they're, they're delegating or passing down to a lower level of government to a state agency or to uh, let the state handle that, such as the welfare uh, delegation down in the uh, 90s to a, the new welfare program. However, much of the federal expense remains here because the, uh, the federal tax dollars have to foot the bulk of the bill. But what they are doing is delegating the, uh, the manpower to do that job, passing it down to the state government or even perhaps even lower to a local level government in order to get that public good or public service done. So that's why you see the increase in the state and local employees. However, the federal government expense still gets bigger because it has to foot most of the bill. Devolution means at least we're trying to pass down a lot of that manpower to a lower level of government. And then one final way to try to reduce bureaucracy is, of course, very difficult, is to privatize that particular sector. That's difficult to do because if somebody could make a profit off of that public service, then somebody would be doing it very successfully for a long time. And that's why you have various attempts to privatize education, privatize transportation. But in general, if it's a public good, that means it's fairly difficult for somebody to make a profit off of it. So that's why most of the goods that we consider public goods and public services are typically have to be handled by the government. Now, the government can contract out some of those and save some of the expense as far as doing the work. In fact, they can contract out prisons. And this is another controversial uh, aspect of government where they're trying to save money by contracting out the operation of prisons. However, the expense still remains because that contractor is getting paid by the government, but the government is requiring that contractor to, to do what the government would have to do to maintain that facility and to treat its pr prisoners fairly and, and maintain their human rights and all that kind of thing. So it's, again, another very difficult way of trying to reduce the bureaucracy because Removing a program from the public sector is hard to do because it may not be able to, to survive on its own trying to make a profit at that particular service.